Picture a rich land ruled by tribes and divined by druids. Gold flows from its mines, wine from its cups. It wasn't always a peaceful life there, but one worth fighting for. This is France and Antiquity, the land known to the Romans as Gaul. Gaul plays an important role in French history, not to mention the wider Roman and European histories. Avant Clovis, nous avons la préhistoire gallo-romaine et gauloise. So said the post-war president of France, Charles de Gaulle. Before Clovis, we have Gallo-Roman and Gallic prehistory, he announced to the nation, clearly extending the French narrative back to the tribes of Gaul. Clovis was the Merovingian king of a united Francia, first of his kind, but many Gaulish heroes are lauded with statues and other dedications around France. One amongst them holds pre-eminence. He's the subject of this video, and although the clue's in the title, I'll draw out the suspense just a little bit longer and tell you all the story of why and how he rose to power, only to come crashing down at the feet of a god. So, on to early Gaul. From the Iron Age, going back almost to the beginning here, for a very long time the Arverni tribe were preeminent in Gaul. They were expert smiths and enjoyed tributes from their neighbours. But that's not to say the other tribes liked this, since each for the most part enjoyed their own autonomy, their own kings, their own druids. Some were friends, and some were foes. At the time, the Arverni's friends were the Allobrogues, and their foes were the Haidui but a new contender was about to enter the scene. From the first time they met, Romans and Gauls entertained an on-again, off-again relationship. The Gauls were wealthy and powerful, and by the classical period, the tribes lived in prosperous settlements called Dunoi in Gaulish, or Oppida in Latin. They first met in the second century BCE, when the Seluvi tribe attacked the Greeks who had colonized Massalia, modern Marseille. These Greeks, who feared losing their Mediterranean outpost to these fearsome warriors, besieged Rome for help. So began the first excursions of Rome into Gaul. The Romans managed to defend Massalia, but the Seluvi didn't go down that easily. They went to the Allobrogues and the Arverni, who assembled together under the banner of the Arverni king Vituitus. So went the First Gallic War, a bloody affair culminating in a Roman victory by Gnaeus Domitius Ahenobarbus and Quintus Fabius Maximus at the Battle of the Isere River. Thereon, Romans and Gauls lived more peacefully. The Gauls continued to prosper, their wealth expedited by trade with Rome. But not all were so happy. The Arverni hegemony in the region Rome called Gallia Narbonensis was broken, the Haidui coming to prominence with eventual Roman backing. The Arverni slumbered in relative historic obscurity until nearly a century later. In 63 BCE, a trade war broke into a real heated war between two Gaulish tribes, the Sequani and the Haidui. Remember them from just now? Well. The Sequani managed to secure the aid of a Germanic tribe called the Suebi, and, you guessed it, the Arverni. The Arverni chieftain at this time was one Celtilus. Keen to topple the Aedui again, they scored a victory at the Battle of Magatobriga. This lit a fuse which would change Gaul forever. The king of the Suebi, Ariovistus, never left Gaul, and instead began settling Sequani and Haidui lands. Provoked by these events, another Gaulish tribe, named the Helvetii, were making moves of their own. Under the leadership of Orgetorix, who had conspired with the prominent leaders Dumnorix and Casticus of the Haidui and Sequani, the Helvetii and four other tribes burned their homes in the Swiss plateau and began emigrating with the intention of settling in Gallia Aquitania via Provincia Narbonensis. Two things to note here, the first being that despite Dumnorix's clandestine dealings, the Haidui were still officially allies of Rome. The second was that Provincia Narbonensis was actually a Roman-controlled province coming into their power as Transalpine Gaul after they defended the Greeks of Massalia against the Arverni and Allobrogues in the 2nd century BCE. 
So when the Helvetii started their march towards the province in 58 BCE, the governor of Transalpine Gaul made sure he was there to stop them. He happened to be a young general named Gaius Julius Caesar. The migration of the Helvetii was just what he needed to move more ambitiously into Gaul with the intention of making it a Roman province in full. The Helvetian forces were eventually defeated at the Battle of Bibracte later that year. And flushed with victory, Caesar turned his attention to the Suebi, who, as you'll recall, were themselves settling dangerously close to Roman lands under Ariovistus, now drawing in thousands more Germanic people into Gaul across the Rhine. The Aeduan druid Diviciacus had five years earlier, in 63 BCE, been sent as an ambassador to Rome to ask them for help against Ariovistus, but the Senate had decided it were better he be an ally at the time. But with the Helvetii defeated and many of the tribes who would have been displaced by them suddenly very grateful towards Rome, the prospect of a Roman Gaul now seemed much more tangible to the Senate, or to Caesar at the very least. He therefore decided to listen to Diviciacus when he again pleaded for assistance taking out Ariovistus. So with Diviciacus as their guide, Caesar's forces headed swiftly for the Rhine, where they destroyed Ariovistus' army decisively. This led to a series of campaigns against many more Gallic tribes, extending all the way to Caesar's invasion of Britain. There was a revolt under Ambiorix of the Epironis tribe, and it's said that Celtulus of the Arverni, a hero we've previously mentioned, was a known belligerent against Rome. He had in fact Principatum Galliae Totius Optinuerat, achieved power over all Gaul. Now Plutarch says that Celtulus Galatae Tyrannida Docunta Pratin Apectinan, the Gauls executed because they believed he was moving towards a despotic rule. However, with his death, another key rebel leader rose, and he was arguably Rome's greatest enemy of the time, his son, Werkin Getorix, and roll credits. Werkin Getorix, or Verkin Getorix, or even Vercingetorix, both of which of those I'll avoid saying, was born into Arverni nobility. And yes, the more correct pronunciation of his tribe is technically Arwerni, but I've started now, so I might as well carry on. His father, as I just mentioned, was not only chieftain of his tribe, but at one point the most powerful of all Gauls who opposed Rome. The information on Celtulus is sadly incredibly brief though, perhaps because he was subjected to a damnatio memoriae, a wiping of his memory from the annals of time. And although his son would soon find his place in it forever, we can only conjecture on Werkengeterix's early life. He would have been born in around 80 BCE. Werkengeterix probably wasn't his birth name, since it means king over warriors in Gaulish. The Arverni Gauls of this time would have been using the Greek alphabet due to Massalia's influence, and so it was spelt like this, Werkengeterix, a name Floris described as quasi a terrorum compositor made as if to terrify. His first decade of life were blood-soaked years for the Roman Republic. Sulla had imposed his will over the Senate, leading to the Sertorian Civil War and a rebellion under Marcus Aemilius Lepidus, father of the future Triumvir. It also saw the Third Servile War, with the slaves of Spartacus take on the might of Rome. Werkengeterix would have been in his late teens or early twenties when the Sequani sought out the Arverni's help against the Aedui. As the son of the chief in a time of war, it's not hard to imagine he'd have partaken in this conflict, being present, or even a wartime leader, when Ariovistus entered Gaul, the Helvetii migrated, and Caesar's military incursions began to crush both of them. The years that followed were tumultuous indeed, fraught with uprisings and political machinations, Caesar putting down revolts from some tribes and plying others with gifts, playing the Gauls against each other, preparing for total annexation. After the defeat of Ambiorix in 53 BCE, the situation seemed desperate, and the resolve of the Gauls seemed drained of all desire to be free. But Werkengeterix summae potentia adulescens, a young man of the very highest power, would not let his will, nor the will of Gaul, be broken. There was only one snag. He was the son of a tyrant, bereft of his hereditary power, and lacking all the influence an Arverni chieftain's son ought to have. 
He gathered his closest allies and friends and with the charisma of a born leader, spurred them to arms and led them to the Arverni capital Dunon of Gergovia. But it wasn't enough. His uncle Gobanitio, who had taken over the tribe after Celtulus, expelled Wurkengeterix for fear of incurring the wrath of Rome. So the young Gaulish rebel took to the country to rally the tribes himself, an independent noble of a dishonoured family determined to overcome the odds no matter what it took. Travelling through the lands of the Arverni, Biturgis, Carnuntis and Sequani, he sought out the Gaulish crowds. At their dies festa and their conciliabula, their festivals and their meeting halls, cum frequentissimo sin lucis haberet, when he found them amassed in great numbers in their sacred groves, ferocibus dictis ad jus pristinum libertatis ere exit, he inflamed them with his furious words to believe once more in their ancient right to freedom. You can imagine what a sight it must have been. Thousands upon thousands had suddenly found their hope restored. This young man, Perimeces Caientois Hopulis Deinos Eneprepen, very tall and truly imposing in his armour, now led his allied forces from our four separate tribes back to Gergovia, where he in turn banishes his uncle and assumes his rightful position as chieftain of the Arverni, now more powerful than ever. He immediately set about sending emissaries to the other tribes, border to border, coast to coast, the Sononis, Perizii, Pictonis, Cadurci, Turonis, Aulerci, Lemoicis, and more. Caesar himself states that omnium consensu ad eum defertur imperium, all agreed to confer the leadership of the rebellion on him. From these tribes he began amassing an even mightier force, establishing hostages to secure loyalty, producing weapons and armour, infantry and cavalry forces. Summa diligentiae summam imperi severitatum adit. He added the strictest of authority to his unbreaking resolve. His first move with this army was to march into the lands of the Ruteni and the Biturigis, who both ended up allying with him too. But the Biturigis were dependent of the age old Arverni rivals, the Aidui, who sent word to Caesar of these events. Meanwhile, Wergengeterix continued marching his forces through the lands of tribes not yet allied to him. And Ispola Vielon ten Zunamin Mere, Kai Polu Sebistersa Seyamonas, Uikiuto ten Perix Hapasan, dividing them into many companies with many officers placed in charge of them, began winning the whole country round. He did so with a mix of charm and terror, eventually assembling a force over 50,000 strong by modern estimates, hundreds of thousands more by the sources of the time. When Caesar heard of these movements, so began in truth the most significant chapter of the Gallic Wars for which both he and Wedkin-Geterix are so famous. In the deep winter of 53 BCE, the snow had fallen thick, making the march into Gaul a perilous one, even deemed impossible by some. But Caesar knew that if he delayed, then all tribes would soon fall under the charm of Wergengeterix's leadership, especially since it would seem as though Rome could not protect its allies, namely the Haidui. In short, Wergengeterix had taken him completely by surprise. The Gallic Wars had been raging since 58 BCE, but this young Arverni chieftain with a sudden horde of willing rebels emerged seemingly out of nowhere, blindsiding the Roman general utterly and forcing him to take drastic measures if he was to cling on to Gaul. But Caesar was as Caesar does, so if anyone could achieve the impossible, it was him. He took his legions to Mont Sewenna, the Seven mountain range, and with titanic effort cleared away the six foot snow. He immediately urged his cavalry through the open roads, and they poured into the Arverni lands to spread panic and fear in a shocking invasion. The Arverni countrymen ran to Wedkengeterix, alerting him to Caesar's presence and begging him to protect them. Caesar, for the first time, had the upper hand now. He deceived Wedkengeterix into returning to Gurgovia in the Arverni lands by sending numerous different forces ranging in all directions to confuse him. Meanwhile, Caesar led his own force to the Aidui, where he could create a base and start building another army on the other side of the Seven. But Wedkengeterix responded quickly and kind, and as soon as he discerned Caesar's plan, turned about and marched back through the lands of the Biturigis towards another tribe dependent on the Aidui, the Bui. 
Here he laid siege to the boy Dunon of Gorgobina. Now Caesar was on the back foot. The Gauls were more used to the landscape and had the firebrand Wedekin Geterix keeping morale high. All Caesar could do was send word to the Boii to hold fast until he arrived. Gorgobina was a key settlement for the Romans and their Haidui and Boii allies, and losing it would make Caesar's job all the more difficult. Now we start to see a pattern emerge. Wedekin Geterix was a brilliant tactician and made decisions swiftly. His short but effective campaign against Caesar could well be seen as guerrilla warfare at its best, moving swiftly to keep the enemies on their toes. As Caesar marched to Gorgobina, he did achieve several victories on the way, at Velonodunum, Genabum, and Noviodunum. This was when Werken Geterix made his first mistake. He abandoned his siege to try and take Caesar head on. Though the Romans were nervous about this battle, having seen Werken Geterix's prior success, Caesar reinforced them and ended up inflicting great losses on the Gaulish army. He then moved to take a key settlement of his own, Awaricum, capital of the Biturigis. Werken Geterix, having learned from his mistake, refrained from attacking this time. During a war council, he said to his men, Alia ratione esse bellum gerendum atque antea gestum sit. This war must be carried out differently to the way they were previously done. Omnibus modis huic res studendum, ut pabulatione et comeatu romani prohibiantur. By all means, let them go after Rawaricum, so the Romans would then be unable to find nor procure supplies. Praeterea salutis causa re familiares commoda negligenda. And moreover, the protection of private homes must be deemed less important than the protection of the tribes. We cause atque edificia in kendi oportere. Though villages and houses should be burned, co pabulandi causa adire posse vidiantur where the Romans are seen capable of foraging for themselves. In this way, Werkin Geterix advocated for scorched earth, the deliberate firing of his own lands and settlements, that the Romans would stretch their supplies thin, being unable to live off the land. His men agreed unanimously, and over 20 Dunoi of the Biturigis were burned that very day. But Awaricum, which Caesar was soon approaching, they refrained from burning and instead garrisoned it in preparation for a siege. This was because the Biturigis were too reluctant to burn their beautiful capital to the ground, and Werken Geterix reluctantly conceded. Werken Geterix then laid in wait all around the area, keeping tabs on the Roman legions with updates every hour. Again showcasing his guerrilla prowess, he kept chipping away at Caesar's forces with swift strike attacks, using the terrain to his advantage. And when Caesar did reach Awaricum, Werken Geterix was reprimanded for making this settlement the exception. After nearly a month-long siege, he captured it and slew tens of thousands of its inhabitants. Such a loss, though, did not deter Werken Geterix. He convinced his people again that it had never been his intention to protect Awaricum, and now, if anything, seeing him all the more determined at the loss of so many brave Gauls, they rallied around him with even greater conviction. Now it was time for the tables to turn yet again. Caesar had sent legions to other parts of Gaul, while he himself left Awaricum for Gergovia to strike the Arverni at their heart. And Werken Geterix, ready to face his foe once more, led his forces there himself. The two armies marched either side of the river Allié until Caesar was able to cross. Werken Geterix, unable to contain the Romans any longer, led a forced march to behind Gergovia's walls, ready for a siege. Despite Caesar's military prowess, Werken Geterix used his own powers of persuasion to even the scales, managing to convince, of all people, the Haidui to defect to him. And though Caesar defeated the sudden rebellion from within his own troops, his army was now divided and Werken Geterix had inflicted casualties already. Determined not to lose any more, Caesar pressed onwards. And though he tried to trick the Gauls with a false retreat, the order was not followed, and the Romans broke themselves upon the Alverni walls. Werken Geterix struck at the weakened legions, leading a cavalry charge which caused a retreat in truth, defeating Caesar soundly, taking out thousands in the process. A stunning victory for the Gauls. They took the time at this point to consider next steps and how to follow through on this greatest of achievements. The first decision? Ensure the right man was leading them. Multitudinis suffragis res permititur. Ad unum omnes Werken Geterigem probant imperatorum. It is decided by the votes of the people. 
every one votes to keep Werken Getterix as their general. But Hubris is a bitch, and Werken Getterix, high on his victory, ordered his troops to continue following the Broken Legions until he in turn was defeated again at the River Van Jan. However, Cassius Dio tells a very compelling story here, and he cannot be accused of the same propaganda as Caesar when it comes to his accounts, even if he wasn't a contemporary writer. During this battle, Werken Getterix actually managed to come face to face with Caesar in the melee. Apela ben kai ena kuklosato, umento i kakoanti iriasato, alla kai pantunantion tusta romaios enen kasa nagathus inai aponiose te soterias. Kai avtos hupo de tu plethus, kai hupo tu trasus eptaise. He intercepted and surrounded Caesar, but was unable to harm him. Instead, encouraging the Romans to be brave, making a stand out of fear for their lives, while he himself failed due to his weaker numbers and due to his own audacity. It might be said that had Werken Getterix exercised more patience, acted less rashly in this and in previous examples, his chances at ultimate success might have been higher. But on the other hand, without his fiery temperament and dare to win attitude, he may never have been in the position he was in the first place. As fate decreed, he and his Gauls were again pushed back, when they made their final stand at Elysia, capital Dunon of the Mandubii. It was a bitter siege. Supply lines cut off, the elderly and sick were forced to die, and despite Werken Getterix and his kinsman Vercasse Velonus attempting to target Caesar's weak spots, the odds were against them. The Romans could bring fresh troops and siege engines, and their superior strength began to show. Werken Getterix would sally out again and again, but each time, more Gauls were slain. All hope at last lost, Werken Getterix convened a council. He said to his people in an emotional speech, Id bellum se suscepisse non soarum necessitatium, that he had begun this war not from his own ambitions, sed communis libertatis causa demonstrat, but for the freedom of his people, et quoniam sed fortunae cedendum, and since he must bow to his fate, ad utramque rem se illis offere, seu morte sua Romani satisfacere, seu vivum tradere velint. He offered himself for them to choose, whether they wished to surrender him to the Romans, dead or alive. Hoede tenere sian echontes, uc oliga pragmata paras chontes aeft hois cae caesari, telos paredosan eeft hus. Those who defended Alicia, after causing no small trouble for either themselves or Caesar, finally surrendered. And Werken Getterix, still living, rode out alone to offer himself to Caesar. He had donned his finest armour and circled the Roman general on his horse. And in a sudden moment, as if pulling a plaster off swiftly, leapt from his mount, stripped off his armour and knelt motionless at Caesar's feet. He was taken to Rome, where instead of being executed quickly, was kept a prisoner for several years. But his legacy lives on, and he remains a folk hero to many today, a champion in the face of oppression. He is a particular inspiration to his home province of Auvergne, and to many others who would fight for the freedom and rights they are due.